So welcome to another session of Present Her. And today is a special honor because uh, the guest we have, Lisa Sthalekar, is a lady of, I don't know, I mean, multiple doesn't even begin to describe it. Uh, talents, interests, hobbies, commitments, stories. I mean, you name it. I have no idea how we're going to do this because in the time we have, there's no way we're going to do anywhere near justice. But let's make a humble effort. Lisa, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. So, you know, it's, it's always difficult when we have someone of, of the sort of multifaceted personality as you are to decide where to start. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, uh, I'm wondering whether it might be a good idea to start as, uh, as uh, Julie Andrews says in uh, Sound of Music, at the very beginning. May not be a bad place to start. Do you, do you want me to sing as well? The Sound yeah, of Music. Brilliant. Want to, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>, right. Um, <laughs> Let's, let's touch upon uh, the, the aspect of how destiny and how the yeah. whole sort of map of how your life has, has panned out uh, seems to have been something that was scripted by somebody sitting somewhere up in the, up in the heavens maybe. Will you share with our viewers uh, how that came to be and how you have actually dealt with it? Because different people deal with these things very differently and you yeah. dealt with it remarkably. So for, for those that, that aren't aware, I was actually adopted at three weeks of age. Um, the story pretty much goes along the lines that um, my adoptive parents uh, who had already adopted uh, a girl from Bangalore, um, they were living in America at the time um, and they came back to India because my father's Indian, my mother was white English and they were looking actually to adopt a son. Uh, and they travelled around uh, Bombay, which is where my father's from, and uh, went to a few orphanages. And they couldn't really seem to connect or find a child that they, they wanted to adopt. Uh, a few people suggested that they go to Pune, um, and uh, they went to my orphanage, and they were actually flying out, I think, on the Monday, and this was like a Friday. So they went there. Um, obviously, no boys again. Um, but the people there said, look, there's this little girl, she's actually out on loan um, because I, my understanding is, is if you've got a lot of kids within the orphanage, there's not as many staff to give them the love and care. So they kind of put them out to, to foster for a weekend or a couple of days so that they get a bit of love and attention. So I was at one of those houses and um, supposedly the, the story goes, my, my parents now um, went past, that had a look at me and... Uh, fell in love with me straight away and said, yep, um, we would like to take her, which kind of blows my mind. We're in 2020 and you can't just go, yep, I'll have that one. Thank you. Um, there's so much legal proceedings that take place nowadays. But um, so, yeah, I, I, I was adopted by them. Um, as I said, they were flying out on Monday to the US. So how do you get um, a passport and uh, a visa in time? And thankfully, my father's father was uh, quite well known in Bombay. Um, and there was an, an older gentleman who had always been very thankful with my grandfather and what he had done. Um, and he was waiting to repay the favour. And the favour came along that they needed the passport and the visa done pretty much within, you know, less than 12 hours. And, and it happened. So, um, so yeah, went and lived in America, Kenya, and then immigrated uh, to Australia when uh, we were four years of age. Isn't that, isn't that just remarkable that, uh, as, you, as you so eloquently describe it, everything sort of fell in place almost perfectly and and just goes to show that good deeds always come in and and repay in more measure than when one can imagine so from a from a girl uh, in in some ways the story of sunil gavaskar which is not what this program is about where they say that he was uh, placed in a in a crib uh, where his uncle noticed that the baby that was meant to be taken home by the gavaskars was different because of a uh, a small deformity on the ear 
Otherwise, Sonny might have ended up being a fisherman's boy somewhere on a, on a beach mm. in Mumbai. I don't know if you're aware of that story, but that's, nice. that's a remarkable coincidence. So yes, these things do happen. So you, you went to Michigan first with your, with your parents. You then spent some time in Kenya. And then, as you say, you moved to Australia. Now, moving to Australia and growing up there uh, mm. in what clearly is, uh, based on the li limited amount I know, a multiracial society, uh, people from different parts of the world have come yep. together and yet the undercurrents, I don't know how, how it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it's a lot more greater degree of awareness today. Was it hard, Lisa, for someone who was maybe not part of the majority, so to say, was it hard? Were you, did you feel differentiated in any manner uh, as you went through school and, and the early years? Well, one thing probably that differentiated my family to other, I guess, Indian families that, that came and settled in, in Australia. Firstly, my mum was white English um, and we only spoke English in the, the family household. Um, we didn't have any relatives, nor did we join any Indian community when we came to Australia. So it was almost like we decided to make Australia our home and because we had no family or external family. It was like, right, how do we embed ourselves into the Australian culture? Um, and maybe that allowed us to feel like Aussies. Like if you close your eyes and you hear my accent, it's very Australian. I've got a nice distinct Australian twang. Um, so I guess from that point of view, I never felt any different. Um, and now my story is completely different to my sister's. And you think that, you know, we've, yeah. we've, we've been brought up in the same household with the same loving parents, the same opportunities. But obviously different people go through different things. So, um, so my experience personally was fine. Um, I enjoyed being outdoors. I loved playing sport. I'm in a country that um, thrives and, and admires and, and, and almost puts people on a pedestal if you're good at sport. So I was able to probably fit in a lot he, uh, you know, it was a smoother transition compared to potentially my sister um, because of the sporting aspect. Uh, so school-wise, everything like that, I felt, you know, quite comfortable. I was playing sports. I was, my weekends, my week weeknights were busy with training and playing games. Um, and sport was, was the one thing that, you know, I just, I just took to and loved playing. So that allowed me to, to fit in. It was only probably a little bit uh, when I was older and we had family friends come over from England and they were two other Indian girls and it was my sister and the two girls and we were walking around the shops in the shops which are predominantly white Australians and I noticed a lot of people looking and then I was like why are they looking why we're just going shopping um, and then I looked around and I was like okay yeah we probably stand out that was probably the first time that I had noticed and then the other time was when I traveled to India in 2004 with the Australian women's side. And that was the first time I'd been back without my family. And so I'm walking down the main streets of Mumbai through the marketplace and no one's hassling me and everyone else behind me is getting hassled. I was like, oh, well, I fit into this culture pretty well. Um, I can enjoy it. So they're probably the two occasions I remember distinctly going, okay, I'm a bit different to them, you know, and them being behind me type thing. So, um, but other than that, I always gloated I had the best tan out of the, um, the team um, and, uh, and I reveled in that as, as often as I could. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, that, that sort of automatically leads me to my next question. Uh, I've been told reliably that cricket <laughs> wasn't your first choice. You, it, it sort of, you tennis competed or maybe even overshadowed cricket in the early years. Tell us about how that transition happened or what made you make the choice. Yeah, so you're right, tennis. So your source is absolutely right. I had tennis posters up on, on my wall of um, uh, Ivan Lendl, Stefan Edberg, um, Boris Becker, Steffi Graf. You know, Wimbledon was the title I wanted to, 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 be, to be able to, to raise. Um, yeah, tennis was my first sport and it was a sport I started to play competitively. Um, get into the representative sides, uh, rep squads. It's when I started to actually do some, you know, physical training as well, all around footwork, speed work, um, short, sharp efforts. Uh, cricket was always a sport that I enjoyed. 
So um, cricket was the social, I guess, the social aspect, the team aspect, get to hang out with my mates, even though they were all guys anyway. But um, uh, that was my fun, fun sport. And tennis was the serious sport. So probably wasn't until I was about um, probably 14, 15, maybe 15 years of age was when I made the switch. And it was simply because um, I found tennis a really lonely sport. Um, yeah, and mm. it and it was quite bitchy as well. Like on the representative circuit, you know, your doubles partner became your enemy at singles, and parents were fighting about bits and pieces. And I'm like, this is a sport that I just want to revel at. I don't want all the politics. Or and I guess that was the first time for me to see how parents, administrators, the politics in sport, and it just took away the fun aspect. And one thing I noticed straight away was that I enjoyed playing in a team. And it was probably around that similar time that I got into the under 18 um, New South Wales state squad. So all of a sudden I started to see a pathway from a cricket point of view. <laughs> now you look at tennis back then even, and you look at cricket, the pathway, and there's a bit more of a clear road in cricket. And there's, it's a windy path that takes a lot of hours out of your life. And I guess I chose the fun aspect. And, you know, I have no regrets with that. Um, I made that decision. I remember actually throwing a game of tennis um, at a, a representative competition. Um, and my father stormed off and said, I knew you threw the match. And I said, yeah, because I don't want to play anymore. That was my first time that I kind of came out to my parents saying, I don't want to play tennis anymore. And then from then they supported my decision and I guess it's turned out okay now. Oh, it's turned out brilliantly. I mean, it's, it's tennis is lost, arguably. But uh, <laughs> you mentioned your parents. I know that your, your parents, like most kids, parents have had a big, big role to play and, and obviously have influenced your choices to a certain extent. Uh, was your father uh, particularly instrumental in, in any manner in terms of either coaching or uh, directly involved with either tennis or cricket or both? Um, my father will say that I've learned all my cricket from him and he knows that that's an absolute lie. But he likes to, <laughs> to, to, to boast now. Um, my father, obviously Indian-born, um, loved cricket, you know, went to CCI to watch the Indian team when he was a young boy and so had always had a passion for the game. And he certainly passed that on to me because... I guess I was daddy's little girl and I wanted to be like him. Um, so he exposed me to the game. We went to the SCG when I was young and, you know, it was all great. Um, and obviously I spent a bit of time in the backyard playing with him. But he was certainly aware of the fact that from a sporting point of view, he didn't have the skills to be able to help me out. So I was very fortunate from a young age, tennis and cricket, that I was able to get private coaching straight away. And I think that allowed my 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 sports whatever I chose to accelerate um, but yeah certainly he he uh, he started the the fire in my belly to to want to play the game so I do owe him a, a lot of a lot of credit to that and then I have to also thank my mother who literally um, when I was uh, growing up in school would pick me up from school feed me a meal then would go off to training drive me the taxi driver literally um, and, and my chef, my personal chef. There were times that I, I still remember like year 11 ringing up at lunchtime going, mum, I'm really hungry. I reckon I'll need a quiche or something when I get home. And lo and behold, there'd be a quiche when I got home. So, you know, the, they, they were two people that were very dedicated to uh, helping me out. And then my sister um, was a number one supporter, even though she, she may have felt fallen asleep a lot at cricket. Um, she always came, which was very good, right to the end. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that, that's very interesting. Isn't it remarkable, uh, Lisa, that in, in so many great sporting careers and even in life otherwise, the people who often stand behind and make it possible yeah. uh, don't often get spoken about, don't often get the credit. Not that they're craving for it. I think their offspring or their, their sons or daughters or uncles, whoever they are, their success is what they, they take joy and pleasure in. Uh, I want to digress for a second and touch upon another area which is obviously becoming a very important part of sport and life in general, which is how to cope with, with personal tragedy or personal challenge and particularly when from a mental health perspective, 
you get into an, a space which is not entirely comfortable. Uh, yeah. It is something that is fortunately, I think, being spoken about a little more today than it used to be back in the day. And yeah. we know from what we've read and heard that uh, after the unfortunate passing away of your mother, you had a similar challenge. For the benefit of the younger people in particular mm. who are watching this, would you care to just walk us through how you cope with it and what your advice to anyone who would be in that kind of position? Because today's world of COVID is not helping this situation. So no. very, very appreciated if you could please uh, shed, shed some. Yeah. Look, I, I think um, obviously my mother passed away when I was 21, 22. Right? And it's, that's a long time. We're coming up to 18, 19 years now. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, my mother was the glue to our, our family and did everything for us. So you kind of take that glue away and you kind of all of us fell apart in our own unique circumstances. Well, one thing that I was fortunate about is um, the hospital that she, she passed away in, they provided um, uh, grief counselling. And so what I did was, you know, for six months, I formed a really good relationship with my grief counsellor. And she almost became, because especially I think with a mother um, and a daughter, or maybe even with a son, that you go and you share your day-to-day -day activities and what's been going on, what your friends are doing, all of that type of stuff. So I lost that person. So my grief counsellor, you know, which is great, they got paid basically to listen to me. And it was my chance to kind of get everything that was off my chest. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote a, a diary and I still actually have it of, you know, after mum passed away, how I coped, what I was thinking, what I was feeling. Um, and I find, and hence probably why I went down the track of psychology as well, found it very interesting, the, the roller coaster of emotions that happen um, when you're, you're dealing with grief. Um, you know, a, what I also used as, as probably a way to escape was my cricket. Um, I think I learned early on that once you turn up to cricket, you put aside whatever's happening. Now I had obviously some wonderful teammates um, and some teammates actually who had already lost one of their parents. So there was a kind of network there already around me that were obviously were very understanding, very forgiving, um, willing to help out. Um, I think it's important firstly to get the help that you need. And sometimes you think you may not need help, but you probably just need to talk. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in, in talking about your feelings, sharing with people that are close to you how you're going and it's okay if it's if things are tough and you're having a really dark day and um, I, call, I used to call it the clouds are kind of coming over me you know I, I used to get really foggy I couldn't I couldn't make decisions I didn't know what I wanted to eat I didn't know what I wanted to watch I just wanted to sleep you know you've got to kind of pick up on all of those um, telltale signs um, and people around you need to be able to express their concern as well so we were fortunate for, for my whole family that we had that support. But the only thing that takes, that will heal you is time. And, and do you ever really get over it? I don't think you do. You just learn to adapt and, and deal with it um, and move on. So, um, yeah, I think it's important that initially you get the help that you need. And then um, I, I kind of went through a couple of relapses as well. A few probably, so she passed away in 2002 and uh, 2009 I went through a really dark phase as well um, and that was kind of highlighted around cricket as well it was um, physiological burnout um, mental fatigue and then the, the depression kind of came back as well so um, again it was trying I tried to battle my way through it it wasn't until my father said you need to get some help you need to probably be on antidepressants um, and I think also there's a stigma about um, well, you, sh you should be able to cope, you know, chin up, off you go, get on with it. Um, or have a, have a, here in Australia, we say have a cup of concrete and harden up. Um, so there, there are all of those sayings, um, and I'm sure that there'd be heaps from a cultural point of view over in India as well, where you just need to get on with it. But sometimes you can't. You actually physically can't. And um, mm. that's when you need the help and support of the people around you. And, and I'm glad to say that cricket and, and other aspects of, um, of the sporting field and even from a corporate point of view, um, mental health is um, spoken about a lot more positively that, yep, everyone's going through it. And I think we've seen in this COVID-19 being in lockdown, 
not being able to socialise, travel, do your normal routines, daily activities has really affected people's mental health. So it is a big concern and um, something that I'm certainly comfortable to talk about and share my experiences, but certainly I'm a good listener as well if anyone needs uh, an ear. Thank you. I mean, that, that is really remarkable and just goes to show uh, the kind of person you are, Lisa, because it's not often that you see people who are in the public eye, who, who are public pers personas in many ways, willing to say what you said and most importantly, willing to offer what you just did. So thank you so much for that. Let's change gears now to your cricketing career, which is obviously what a lot of people want to hear about. And it's a stellar one. I don't have to tell anybody that. I mean, four World Cup titles in both formats of the 50 and 20 over game. Uh, double figure uh, WNCL titles, five consecutive ones. The first lady ever to get to the all-rounders double of 100 and 1,000, uh, 100 wickets and 1,000 runs and doing it at Lords, uh, just, just to boot. Uh, did you actually think when you began that this was the ki these were the kind of dizzying heights that you would uh, potentially be able to reach or wanted or aspired to and planned for? in terms of how you prepared and how you went about your game? I think for me and personally, it was never about what's the final number mm. <laughs> that I want to get to. It was never about individual statistics. And to be, and I'll give you a prime example, this, the double of the hundred and the uh, thousand runs and a hundred wickets. I had no idea until I think last month when someone tweeted that I got it at really? Lord's. I actually didn't know where it was. So that just shows you women's cricket back then and stats. There was no big screen. There was no crowds. There was no cheering. Well done, Lisa. You're the first. There was nothing of that, that kind. Um, so, so for me, what, what motivated me was I wanted to play the game of cricket and I wanted the team to be successful. And I was very fortunate to be part of, you know, certain generations that dominated not only international cricket, but also from a, a domestic point of view as well. So um, what motivated me was world titles, was WNCL domestic titles, um, and that I played a role with the bat and ball. Now looking back at my career, you know, after it's passed, I guess there's a part of me that's disappointed I didn't go on with those 60s, 70s scores and turn them into big hundreds because for me I was all... I felt that I was a batting all-rounder. But if you look at my stats, you'll go, oh, you look at the numbers, she's a bowling all-rounder. And I got into the Australian team and the New South Wales team because they needed a spinner. But I was an opening bat in all of my junior cricket. I opened the batting for Australia. When I first debuted for Australia, I batted at 11. Three years later, I think I was opening with Belinda Clark. And then I finally slotted down to three, four. And then I think right at the end, I went back to, to five. Um, in the one day team. So um, yeah, I've always seen myself as a batting all rounder, but uh, for me, like I said, it was all about winning titles and I was fortunate enough to win plenty of them as well. Certainly you have. Uh, hearing and reading about some of the adjectives that your teammates, both at New South Wales and Australia, have used for you, uh, oh. seems to be a very interesting uh, sort of mix of them. So I'm gonna throw a couple at you and see yep. Uh, if you will help us understand how you balance the two. I mean, there's something as uh, uh, something that someone said, which is, oh, she's as silly as the youngest person in the team. Uh, she's, uh, she's a prankster. And then the, the one common refrain that comes out, wow, she is competitive beyond recognition. Do not get on the wrong side. Uh, how does this sort of easygoing, fun-loving aspect of pranks and, you know, being silly and all of that, uh, balance itself with this really classic Aussie, got to win, got to do this, make it happen approach. How does that balance itself? Yeah, I'd probably say later on in my career, the more pranks, the silly side of me came out. Um, and I think the silly side, the people that would have said it were Elisa Healy and Elise Perry because we were the three little monkeys at the back of the bus that just kind of, we kind of, um, we'd have our own little little group where we'd do stupid things. And, uh, and sometimes everyone else, and we felt everyone else was so serious. Like, I think there needs to always be a balance in a, in a team environment. Yes, you need 
your serious players to drive what you're trying to do. But also you need to have fun along the way because certainly back then we weren't getting paid. We were playing because we wanted to. So if we're going to give up that much time of our life to the sport, let it at least be fun. That's what I used to say. Um, but certainly uh, as soon as I got into a game, as soon as I crossed the line, um, I had been taught, and you know, this is where probably the New South Wales senior players, Linda Clark, Lisa Kitely, even our coach, Steve Jenkins, there were little things that um, enabled us to be so professional in everything that we did, apart from getting money as a professional athlete. Like for instance, we would we were never allowed to wear thongs in our in our training uniform or playing uniform, whereas you see guys now they walk around after the game with thongs because they want to air out their feet. For us, it was you look the part. If you're going to wear this uniform, wear it with pride and look the part. So little things like that were instilled in me at a, a re at a really young age. And I guess from there, I also taught when I played with them, when you cross that line, you're there to win a game of cricket. How you win it is up to you. Um, be fair, but be really hard and be ruthless and don't let people, don't give them a sniff. So my competitive um, streak, I probably owe it to my father actually, because he's also a Leo. Um, and every time we play table tennis um, or any kind of game, snooker, Backyard cricket, it was like we both wanted to win. Um, and and that was kind of instilled in me very at a very young age as well. So even in training, I would muck around and have fun. But then when it was my turn to bowl or bat or something like that, it would be game on. The game, the game face would come on. But the great thing about cricket is you're on for, what, 10, 15 seconds when the bowler starts running up. And then you've got another probably 45 seconds as they make their way. So you don't need to be that serious all the time. I think if you are that serious, you're going to burn yourself out in cricket. So you've got to have a bit of fun along the way. Always, always room for, for easing the tension. Uh, while we are at cricket and talking about cricket, uh, in the era when, when you played the bulk of your cricket, even though other countries, India in particular, was coming up, it seemed to us from the outside that it was still very much a England, Australia, New Zealand kind of uh, at the top of the game. How do you how do you build that that culture? I know you've been in leadership positions. You're part of the association. In fact, the first lady to be part of the players' association. You do a lot of coaching work. We'll talk about some of your philanthropic uh, aspects in just a moment. But how do you personally, along with your colleagues who may be like-minded, look to drive this through? in the countries where it's not so popular and places like India where it's it's a crazy love but somehow there still is something missing what is that as for India um, I, I believe it, it is the most untapped market um, when, when it comes to the women's game and you know I've been fortunate enough to do some work with Rajasthan Royals and gone out to schools and um, I've had a look just more probably more so in Rajasthan what's the pathway for a you know, a 12-year-old girl, if she loves the game of cricket, where does she go? And it's not really a systematic pathway. Yes, there is in Mumbai, Bangalore, Delhi, um, probably Chennai as well. Um, but there isn't for those smaller villages. And you look at even the Indian women's side at the moment, a lot of them come from the villages, smaller towns outside of the main cities, and, and they somehow find their way. But what if there was a proper pathway, a process? Um, that could pick up talent along the way. But also, India as a nation just loves the game of cricket. Yet, there are, there are thousands of opportunities for young boys to play it. There isn't that many for girls. So, um, you know, my, part of my work with Rajasthan Royals is to create more opportunities for young girls. So, if they love the game and want to play it, they can. Um, and they don't have to play it against boys if they don't want to. If they're good enough and they want to compete, I have no hesitation in saying, go for it. Keep playing with the boys because it will certainly um, test your skills out. But, but certainly, uh, India, if they start to, to put some processes and pathways all the way down in more of a grassroots area, they certainly got it from, um, you know, state competitions, you know, your under-19s and potentially there's talks about an under-16 competition. If you go even further down, if you get that sorted, 
wow, you talk about a bucket full of people and then you only have to pluck out a few more, you're going to have some very talented cricketers coming through. Well, I'm sure that people people in the know at the BCCI will, will, will have taken notice if they haven't already. Uh, yes, there's been a journey uh, and there's a lot more that needs to and hopefully will be done. Let's move, just given the interest of time, Lisa, uh, to the aspect of you moving from on-field exploits to sort of getting into the commentary box, whether it is radio or television. And uh, as you made that transition, in some cases, you would have been talking about uh, former teammates. Uh, and then, of course, yeah. as time goes along, you're looking at other people. Now, there are different views of different people about how... Uh, the transition is made. There's no question that, that people who've played the game at your level understand it and understand its nuances and so on and so forth. What is it that led you to go into commentary? Was it again something that you planned? Is it something that happened by accident? And did you have to sort of mentally think differently when you were talking about the game to viewers and listeners? So my first exposure in the commentary box was 2010. I was still playing at the time. Elise Perry and I were given the opportunity. They flew us up to Brisbane, um, part of the Channel 9 coverage. And it was the ACA All-Stars versus the Australian team. And it's mm. actually the game that Tim Payne broke his finger. Um, and obviously was the one that caused him, like we, he disappeared off the face of the earth for the, the next kind of five years. Um, but I was given five overs. I sat between Tony Gregg and Mark Nicholas. Um, and I sat down. They put, they didn't have the director in my ear, but I put an earpiece in. And I just, I just sat down and I looked around. And I was like, okay, I'm sitting next to like a legend. Um, Mark Nicholas is obviously, you know, a supreme professional when it comes to broadcasting. And I looked down and I'm like, this is a pretty good view of the ground. I'm right behind the bowler. You can see everything here. And then I've got all the stats in front of me, different screens. And the five overs went like that. And I, that kind of, I went, oh, this is cool. How do I do this job? <laughs> How do I get into this when I finish playing? Um, and that was, that was when I realized I wanted to do that. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, there aren't any females talking about cricket. Why is that? Like, we play the game. Lots of females watch the game. Why don't we have a female? Um, so that's when I started to kind of probably hang around the Channel 9 box a fair bit. Um, every time there was a test at the SCG or One Day Internationals, I was working at Cricket New South Wales, so I had a pass that could get me anywhere. So I'd just go up and say good day to the guys and then I'd stick around and watch, see how it all worked. Um, so I, I, that's probably the first time where I went, okay, great. This is what I want to do. So I started to pick up and learn. And obviously when you start, and you would know as well, that when you watch and listen to a game of cricket, you sometimes just focus on the commentary now. So if that's what your interest is, you, yes, you watch the game, but you listen, how, what do they say? When do they say it? Why do they say it? Um, and then I got my, my real chance to, to commentate um, again, right at the end of my career, ABC Grandstand um, started to cover the Big Bash. And they said, Lisa, would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, I, I've never done it. <laughs> How do you do it? Um, but let's see it. And they said, yeah, let's see if you feel comfortable doing that. So that was probably my first opportunity. And I loved it. I loved it straight away. And so ABC Grandstand started to get me more involved. And when I did retire uh, in 2000, early 2013, the next summer, I did more ABC Grandstand work. Um, Channel 9 got me back in to cover the women's matches, which, again, was really cool, just sitting there and talking about the game. Um, and then 2015 was the moment that changed my life when... Um, some random guy got my number off the ABC Grandstand executive producer and said, look, hi, my name's Simon or Terry. I, I'm a player manager and a commentator manager. Would you like to do the IPL? And I was like, yeah, sure, mate. Like, yeah, in 10 years time. <laughs> but that's kind of, that's the end goal, really. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, well, I, I hear they're thinking about having females. Would you like me to make some inquiries for you? I said, yeah, go for it. Like, 
no harm in asking. And then he rings up two weeks. He goes, yep, you're in. And I'm like, sorry, I'm in. He goes, yeah, yeah. So I went in to Eden Gardens, my first game with Danny Morrison and Tommy Mbangwa. Had Simon Wheeler, who's like the best director in world cricket, um, for those that understand that, has been involved in, in the industry for so long. He was my director. And Eden Gardens is 70,000 people screaming. And I'm like, okay, don't stuff up, Lisa. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And that's the thing. You didn't know what you were doing and you just got thrown in. And, and it's all about having people beside you that are willing to spend a bit of time to help you through. And thankfully I did that. But that was my journey into the commentary box. Almost sounds as fascinating as, as the one uh, on the field in its own way. That, that's going to bring me, Lisa, to a point which is often debated and, you know, people like me in our own little way, uh, but several of us. Players who've played the game at the highest level, uh, their sort of exclusive preserve, if you will, to be in television and radio commentary boxes and align to it, uh, a topic that I know is close to your heart about men commentating on the women's game and more importantly, vice versa. Do you have a point of view about the necessity or otherwise of people who are going to be commentating on radio or TV to have necessarily played the game at the international level? Uh, what do you think about that? And when you come in as an international player, have you seen people who not played the game at that level and are they accepted into the fraternity uh, the same way? Yeah, well, on your point about do you have to have played the game at an international level to, to understand the game? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's important in a commentary box that uh, you have a variety of different people. Um, you just look at in, into a commentary box, a very good executive producer will have different personalities or people with different skill sets as well. One's a bowler, one's a captain, one's a batter, one's a fast bowler, one's a spinner. And they provide that. It's just like building a normal cricket team. You need to have all walks of life. So along those lines, again, you need to be able to have people that sometimes haven't played the game, but probably have studied it a hell of a lot more than me. So someone like Ahasha Bogle knows so much about the game and the history of the game than I do. But he doesn't know what it's like to be out there on the field, but he provides that other aspect. Um, so I, I don't think you should only have people that have played the game. Like sometimes, I'll give you a prime example. Sometimes after a game of cricket when I was younger, I'd ask my mum what she thought, what she saw. Mm -hmm. She has no, she had no idea about cricket, the technical aspects or anything like that. But she could see probably the behavioural things. Oh, mm -hmm. well, you seemed a bit flat. Like everyone wasn't talking very much. Or was there a fight going on out? You know, mums would pick that stuff up. But the cricketer would go, oh, well, you know, you, you didn't back up enough. There wasn't enough movement in the field or someone bowled the wrong line. So I think it's important to get information from a vast group of people that come from different backgrounds. And then you listen to you. Then you've got to think of who's listening or who's watching the telecast. And it's not just the cricket tragics. No. It is people that just love the game. Now, some may never even know what the rules are. Like, the terminology that we have in cricket is ridiculous. How is anyone ever supposed to pick it up? It's like it takes you decades to figure it all out. But So that's why I think it's important to have so many different people. Um, in, terms of, in terms of what I've seen in the commentary box, well, firstly, being a female and coming into a male-dominated industry, um, I never felt... Uh, that they didn't want me there. Um, I had a very welcoming group of commentators and still do. Every commentary box that I go into, um, there is an element of, okay, yep, I'm the only girl. <laughs> Predominantly, I'm the only girl, right? Um, there's always a bit of banter. If you can kind of banter with the boys, then you're on side and let's just get on with it. Um, but I think they want to know, can you do the job? Can you, can you see the game? Are you willing to stand by what you say? Have you got convictions to say what you see? If you do that, which is what you're paid to do, yeah. then it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, I say carry on. Um, from, from my point of view, especially with the women's games now, obviously there's a lot more females within the commentary box. 
Um, but there is a sense of, let me help you out because you're part of my team. So if you don't, if you aren't good, the coverage isn't good. So um, there is a, I feel like I, even though I've left the team environment from playing on the field, we've created a team environment off the field. And, and that's something that obviously um, is something that I'm really passionate about and something that I love to be involved in. Let's, uh, toward, as we come to the end of, end of our time, let's look at some of the quite remarkable social philanthropic coaching related initiatives that, that you're involved with now. I mean, there's of course Adopt Change, which is much closer to you for the reasons we talked right at the beginning. Let's talk a little about Slow Coach, which I thought from what I little I've heard and read, the unique uh, initiative really to be able to help people. And in this time, with, with all the mm -hmm. lockdown and what have you, even more relevant. Uh, what motivates you towards these things? Because from what little I know and what I've spoken to people about you, Lisa, we, have, we don't know each other that well. Hopefully that will change. But you don't seem to me to be at all the kind of person who's going to do it to put a tick in the box. You seem to me to be the kind of person who if she's going to do something, she's going to do it because she means it and wants to make a difference. So talk us through the philosophy and talk to us a little bit about these three or any other uh, initiatives yep. that you're involved with. So I think one thing that probably takes a bit of time for female players, female athletes to understand is that you're seen as a role model, even though that's not why you get involved in your sport and why you want to excel. Um, but I, I, I started to learn that all of a sudden I had a platform that I was able to kind of share some important messages or stories or support a charity that meant something to me for the benefit of them, but also me as well, giving back to, to my community. Um, so probably the first thing that I, that I got involved with was the McGrath Foundation because um, they supply um, breast care specialist nurses across Australia and obviously with my mother passing away because of breast cancer that was obviously an important part to me also a bit like um, the fact that she's English as well which was the case uh, with Glenn's wife so um, there was always this nice association with the McGrath Foundation so that was the first one that I, I kind of got involved in obviously Adopt Change was another one and and that's slightly different. Um, Debla, Deb, Deborah Lee Furness uh, is the founder of that. And it's more about changing the policy here in Australia from a, from a government regulation point of view. Um, there is a lot of red tape that you have to go through. Um, you know, families that can't actually have kids um, from a biological point of view want to adopt and, and have a family, but it takes them three to five years to get a child in yet here in Australia we've got um, you know close to uh, you know I think it's about 80,000 maybe just close to a hundred thousand of young adults in um, foster care system going from house to house why not give them a permanent home um, so yes yeah, so that's obviously another one that I'm involved in uh, the Chapel Foundation is probably the, the more recent one um, and that's around youth homelessness. Um, now, firstly, I guess it goes back to um, the Chapel brothers of all three of them have played an important part in my cricket. Um, Trevor Chapel was actually uh, the Gordon Women's Cricket Club coach. So he used to coach us way back when. So um, I've always obviously admired him. Uh, Greg Chapel through Cricket Australia, I started to have some more discussions with him and, and actually him and my father spoke a lot about sports psychology and, and the mental side of the game, which was something that I was a huge advocate for. And I think I probably got a head start to the rest of my generation because my father was a sports psychologist. So I was doing um, mental visualisation rehearsal when I was 15, 16, 17 years of age instead of once I got into the Australian team. So Greg obviously kind of pushed that. And then Ian Chappell has been a great mentor um, from a commentary point of view. He was one person that I picked up the phone to and said, look, I'm interested in doing this. How do I, how do I become good? How do I get better? Um, so because of who they were, I said, yeah, I'm on board. And then obviously when you go to youth homelessness, it kind of um, touches in on, um, you know, adopt change, uh, you know, kids being out of home, surfing from couches. Uh, there's too many people that are homeless, you know, under 25 years of age here in Australia, 
which is a country that, you know, is, is you know, we, we're privileged to be to living here. So, but yet, why do we have such a big percentage? So, um, more power to you, and uh, hopefully, we'll find more ways uh, to use your heart and mind in in making life better for others. Just at the end, uh, one of the things that I, I've been asked very specifically to talk to you about is if you were to pick uh, either a 50 over or a 20 over, your choice, uh, combined India-Australia 11 out of, cool. let's say, the current crop, crop of uh, girls who are playing, uh, what would that sort of look like in your mind? It's tough. It's a tough squad to pick. <laughs> That's um, why we're asking one of the best. So you want me to go through the batting order? If you would, please. Right. So I'm going to go Lisa Healy. Mm -hmm. All the four openers are so good. Uh, the two team. Um, I'm going to have to go Beth Mooney based on current statistics. As much as I would have liked to have gotten one of the Indian girls in. Uh, number three has to be Meg Lanning. Uh, number four, I'm going to put Smitty Mandana. Mm -hmm. I think I'll, I'm going to. I want her in the side, so I'm going to drop her there at four. I'm going to put Harmon at five. Um, I'm going to go Shifali Verma at six. Ah, interesting choice. Because mm. I because I think she's explosive enough, and it doesn't matter where you put her in the game. Really, she's just going to hit the ball. See the ball, hit the ball. That's my six, okay? Um, so bowling wise, Poonam Yadda straight away in. Um, Megan Shute in. Jess Jonathan as mm. my left arm orthodox. Elise Perry. So, so I've got 10. Yeah, you got 10. Um, I need oh keeper oh no I've got I've got Healy. I want another bowler. Um, got two spinners. I need another pacey. Uh, see the next generation Taylor Valamic or do I go for a, one who's a smart cricketer, experienced Shikapande? So it's it's tough. Those and then the twelfth comes out of. Valamic or Shikapande, depending on the surface and who the opposition is. How does that sound? Fair enough. Fair enough. And would you like to manage that side? If oh, it ever yes, happens? please. <laughs> Pick me. <laughs> they may not want me to manage it, but I want to manage them. <laughs> well, I'm not sure players get to choose managers even today, do they really? <laughs> uh, look, look, Lisa, we, we, could, we could keep talking for, for as long as, as we possibly want to, because there's, like I said, I think we've just scratched the surface of this, this amazing personality called Lisa Staleker. I have to ask you one last thing. How does it feel to have your family name uh, on uh, one of the school houses at yeah. your alma mater? How does that feel? I mean, that must be unique. I can't think of any other cricketer who's got a Tindulkar house or a, or a Ponting house in a school or a college. I can't think of anyone. Yeah, um, that took me by surprise because obviously that will be part of Barker College until they no longer exist. So um, to have the Stalaker house name, um, yeah, I, I was blown away. I only attended the school for two years because um, it was only co-ed in year 11 and 12. Um, made the shift because my father wanted me to go to a, a better school. And, and certainly I, I got exposed to some amazing teachers. Facilities are outstanding. Um, uh, to have a house name as well, majority of people are dead <laughs> that get a house name. Um, that's what, that's the other thing they said. It's, it's a rarity that we have, you know, the house leader still alive. I was like, great, thanks guys. I'm still planning to be around for a while. Um, but yeah, and also probably for that college as well, which was predominantly white, um, mm -hmm. um, to have probably one of the first multicultural named um, I kind of laughed because I said, right, I, I look forward to them pronouncing it and spelling it. At least, at least people will learn over time. Um, 
again, I, I've told them whilst I'm in the country and whilst I'm around, I'm happy to help out. Um, I'm ha happy to be a mentor for, for any of the students going through because um, obviously my mum was sick whilst I was going in year 11 and 12 and the teachers were outstanding. They um, spent plenty of time out of school hours ensuring that I caught up and um, was able to cope with, with all the pressures that came with playing cricket at an elite level and then also dealing with um, a family member who was very sick. So I owe the school a lot um, and for them to, to give me that honour, um, yeah, it, it did blow me away. And well, I think I saw, I think I tweeted about um, the athletics carnival and there was a flag with the Salaka house and it, it yeah, it spins me out every time I think about it. But uh, when COVID-19 disappears and, uh, you know, spectators are allowed to come back, I look forward to going there and hearing all the chants that they, they've all, all the kids have come up with. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Uh, Lisa, thank you. Thank you uh, for, for your time. Thank you for sharing uh, as openly as you have. We look forward to, to catching up. I know Women's Creek Zone is privileged to have you uh, speak to us. Uh, personally, I would love uh, both my wife and daughter enjoyed the one time that we got together yes. and, back and look forward to, to many more. You look after yourself, stay well, and we look forward to catching up soon. So thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much for having me and I'll come back to your place anytime. The food was amazing. So count me in. <laughs>